Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Innan aqibata lil muttaqin wa la udwana illa ahla zalimin. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna sayyidna wa azimana wa habibana Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في العالمين في الاولين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الاخرين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الملأ الاعلى الى يوم الدين we thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us another opportunity for us to be able to come together and talk about um his teachings that he has sent down through prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the religion of islam and one of the be- one of the beauties of the religion of islam and the greatest the greatest miracle that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in this religion is the miracle of the quran that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down through in your jibril onto prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so in the previous sections we took a look at we've taken a look at what it actually means for for us to learn the quran and understand the quran and understand the sunnah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came through the quran so today inshallah we will take a look at the eloquence of the quran and to better understand if the quran actually has some type of mujiza some type of miracle that comes with it and some type of mastermind that comes with it and again all of these goes goes in line with the knowledge and the uh, understanding that the light that Allah has and the understanding he wants us to be able to um get from the Quran inshallah so before i move on i quickly want to say that we would encourage you to um like our page and follow our page should in case so that whenever we have any like, lecture going on or any khalaqa going on uh you can get you know you can learn from me you can uh join us you get the live uh, content and you can join us right away inshallah so without wasting time today we will take a look at the eloquence of the quran we want to take a look at the eloquence of the quran and um we're just gearing up because a few of our members are joining us so we're taking a look at the eloquence of the quran and what that means and how did the, how has the quran be uh, uh been a uh, 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 a tool that muslims should hold on to because of the greater knowledge and the greater wisdom of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's tied to the quran inshallah so we'll take a look at the eloquence of the quran and by looking at this we want to look at three major areas we want to briefly talk about the eloquence of the Quran then we'll talk about the beginning of the surahs how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduce his surahs all right and there are different categories up to 10 different categories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used to introduce his surah all right and what we would know today would be a chapter in layman term or terms a chapter but in Quran we say it's a surah because the surah is more powerful than just saying a chapter. And then the third um item we'll take a look at would be the ending of the surahs, all right? How how did Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala end the surahs in the Quran? So without wasting time, when we talk about the eloquence of the Quran, this is something that's beyond human comprehension. All right the eloquence of the Quran goes to speak to the authenticity of the Quran the eloquence of the Quran goes beyond what a human being can create or what a human being can just write out by themselves the eloquence of the Quran is a science in of itself that within the science you can also bring out more sciences of the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demonstrated to us in the Quran that he is the one that gave us the Quran and out of his infinite knowledge we see that the Quran becomes a more comprehensive book a more comprehensive revelation for all mankind we understand that the muslims that are entrusted with the Quran 
However, the Quran is meant for all mankind because it, it brings about sciences that are even not discovered yet. Sciences that are even not discovered yet. The Quran has a lot of science in terms of mathematics, in terms of human anatomy, in terms of human emotions. Wallahi, in terms of human emotions. And we can take, to, we can take time out to start talking about the different types of um, uh, sciences or different types of knowledge or wisdom that are captured in the Quran. And one person cannot have this type of knowledge. In the 14th century, whenever the Quran, well, in the, uh, uh, when the time when the Prophet Sallallahu was resurrected and sent as a messenger, no one had this knowledge. Many of this knowledge that the Prophet, the Prophet talked about at that time and the calculations, specific calculation, we see them now, people, uh, scientists are just discovering them. So if we claim that the Prophet, if people claim that the Prophet wrote the Quran by himself, where did he get the tools or the knowledge to be able to make those predictions? And we see that those predictions are true facts today. Scientists are just discovering what the Prophet Wasallam told us as a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see that if we go deep into the sciences and the, and the anatomy and the, and the different phases of creation and history that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about in the Quran, the Quran's eloquence alone is an indication that it's not man-made. However, it's a statement of the creator that created this creation. Us as humans, we are part of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ocean, the mountains, the animals, vegetation, all of that falls under the, the, the mastermind, the knowledge, the vast knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that cannot, that cannot be thought of by just one person. When we talk about mathematics, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us different verses that talks about calculation. All right, in the alternation of the, the day, the, the moon and the sun, the night and the day, there's sign in there for us. Math, mathematics would calculate that and they'll be able to tell us what day it is, what time it is, by just looking at the moon and the position of the moon. So again, those calculations, a human being cannot just come, come, come up with it with just thinking about it. They have to do research. They have to do a lot more findings to be able to get to those type of knowledge. But when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi tells us about it, it's only an indication that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is a God that we follow and is a God that we should bow to. And Allah uses this premise for the most part to ask us to worship him because Allah tells us that he is the God that had created and he had demonstrated many of the things that he had created. So if we understand that and we believe that, then that should push us or that should lead us to worship him as the one true God. And it goes to talk about human emotions, how we feel sometimes that our heart get constricted, human movement, how we walk on earth how we run, how we hasten, depending on the different things that are happening to us in different times. It talks about history, history of the people that have passed. You know, the Quran talks about human anatomy, the, feast, the, the human body, all of the different things in the human body, the blood, the water, and the three layers when a woman is pregnant, the child is covered in three different darkness of layers. All of these things, all of the sciences, this knowledge cannot be from her human being. The creation of things like that started from the creator. The knowledge started from the creator and he's the God that we worship and he's the God that we follow. So just, just a little talk, a little spill, a little blurb about the eloquence of the Quran. And now I'm going to go to the second one where I would really like to talk about the beginning of the surahs. How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduce the surahs to us, inshallah. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time here because we, 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 we would really need to understand that when people write books, all right, because the Quran is a revelation and it's captured in hardcover, in front and back like a book, when other people write books, their books cannot be compared to that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their book cannot come close 
to the authenticity that, are, that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. Their book cannot be compared to how the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been preserved. So the Quran is the greatest book on earth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges mankind by asking them to provide a similar book. We see that the way mankind would usually create, write their own book, for example, when people write books, we see that they have chapters, right? And in the beginning, they have a, a table of content, and then they have chapters, and they say, okay, this is the beginning of the chapter, and they start it in a certain way. Many times, the system or the style or the design of the entry into that first chapter or the second chapter or the third chapter takes a form of a story for the most part for the most part it takes a form of a story and sometimes we can just follow through it and we see a correlation where the first chapter follows through the second chapter and the third chapter and it just goes like that and then you understand that one story that way however Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes, does not use that same format. His own is somewhat changed. Allah uses a different style, and his styles are, by the scholars, captured in up to 10 different ways. Up to 10 different ways. And we'll take a look at those 10 different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, written the Quran or has sent out the Quran for us to be able to understand the Quran. But before that, Allah challenges all of mankind. Mankind, humans, and jinn kind, right? Allah challenges all of mankind and all of jinn kind in Surah Al-Isra just to show that the Quran is a book that nothing, it's a revelation that nothing can even come close to it in terms of resemblance. That's one. Nothing can out, out power or outsource the quran nothing can be put higher in terms of preservation than the quran in terms of information nothing come close to the quran in terms of preservation in the mind of people nothing comes close to the quran allah says Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Prophet Muhammad to say to all mankind, if mankind, if all of mankind and the all of jinn kind were gathered, if they gather in order to produce the like of the Quran, a similar type of the Quran, the Quran Allah says, La yatuna bimithli. They will, not, they, will, they will not be able to produce the like of it. Even though, even though both of them, even not, not in, the form, in the form where both groups, now the mankind group and the gene kind group, they, they, they work in a team and they try to produce it together. The initial one was if they work as humankind and if all of human come together to create the Quran, or produce the Quran, they would not be able to do it. If all of jinn kind come together to produce the Quran, they will still not be able to do it. Now, if they come together, now all of jinn kind and all of mankind, they come together to produce a similar type of this Quran, they will not be able to do it. They will not be able to bring anything that's closer in similitude to the Quran. In another part of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if all of the mankind and all of the jinn can come together and they are being challenged to produce only 10 verses that will look like those verses in the Quran, they will not be able to do it. They will not be able to do it. So this goes to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is superior and his superiority in, is demonstrated in the greatest in the greatest miracle that he has sent down to his last prophet, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that greatest miracle is the miracle of the Quran. So by, we want to move forward by talking about the beginning, so the beginning of how Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala introduces the different surahs in the Quran, right? So the beginning of the surahs has different categories. 
they have up to 10 different categories that we can look at to try to identify how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces the Quran and now how we get to understand the Quran by the different styles of communication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used. So we're going to take a look at, inshallah, we're going to take a look at the glorification of the Quran, uh, the, the glorification of Allah. So Allah would introduce or open a surah or start or begin a surah by his glorification, right? Allah uses that. Allah would use a call to open the Quran or to, to open the surah, the beginning of a surah. Allah will use a statement of fact, a statement of fact to begin a surah. In other areas, he uses an oath. He swears or he takes an oath to begin a surah. In other areas, Allah uses a condition. Based on XYZ condition, this is what would happen. So Allah would use those conditions, some conditions to open uh, a surah. And we see that Allah uses a command in some instances to open a surah. And Allah uses questions to open surah. Allah uses invocations like a swear, like a cause. Or Allah demonstrates ways that he empowers or, or he comes upon people by invocating upon them. And that you, he uses that as a, a, a way of opening a surah. Allah also uses a reason or a cause. Allah explains or he shows a reason or a cause as a way to open a surah. And the last and most debated part would be that Allah uses a, a, a different sets of disjointed letters to open a surah. Different sets of disjointed letters to open a surah. So we're going to look at, we're going to use each slide or each deck to take a look at one of all of these 10 uh, categories that we have, inshallah. And we look at the different types of surah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened with this different type or begin with the, do this different types of our categories that we have, inshallah. And we'll start from uh, the glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the first one. So one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would open a surah would be through his glorification, by him glorifying himself as the one true God, right? And the, glorific the glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the phase of a praise, takes the phase of a praise. And we all do this today. We all do this today. If, for example, you go to visit a king, right? You don't enter into the king's house and you just say good morning or good afternoon. We, the way we know how kings are being well are greeted is you sing their praise. You sing the praise of a king. And that's how you enter into the presence of a king. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing us into his presence with some of this surah. So one of the ways he would use is to sing his praise, is to explain or demonstrate his praise to us so we can then enter into his presence by reading the surah. And again, another way is for him, he would explain or introduce to us his names and attributes of perfection. His names and attributes of perfection. Mathalan, for example, the most popular surah in the Quran is Surah Al-Fatiha. And we begin Surah Al-Fatiha by Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen So Allah says Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen This is Fatiha to the Kitab The opening of the book. So a person opens the Quran the first time and they want to learn about the Quran. The first verse they're going to read is Surah Al-Fatiha. So the first thing Allah tells you for you entering into his presence by reading the Quran, Allah praises himself. Allah says, all praises are due unto him, Allah, because he is the God of the universe. So Allah praises himself as an introduction. So the first thing you want to get to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his glorification by him praising himself. What better way to learn about a creator? What better way to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
by the first thing you would mention is that he is the God that's worthy to be praised. Kings of this world do that. They do that today. In the, in the, I mean, we have a lot of kings in Africa, a lot of kings in the Middle East, in different countries. When you enter into a king and you go visit a king, you praise that king. So Allah gives you the same, the same system here. And again, they, they take things like this from the Quran because the sciences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captured in the Quran. Allah tells us in the Quran, and again, when you open the Quran, the first verse you, want, you would recite, the first surah you would recite, the surah al-Fatiha, which is also known as Fatah al-Kitab, the opening of the book, meaning the opening of the Quran. And the first verse you would encounter is Surah Al-Fatiha in, is in Surah Al-Fatiha is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Meaning there is no God worthy to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all praises are due unto him because he is the God of the whole world. All praises are due unto him because he is the God of the whole world. And another, another one we see for Muslims that read Surah Al-Kaf every Friday, they see this verse a lot. Allah tells, says, Alhamdulillah illadi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu i'waja. Allah says, all praises are due unto him that he is the God that has sent down upon his, uh, his servant, Prophet Muhammad, the book, the Quran. So Allah again praises himself in this verse, in, the, in, in this surah, in Surah Al-Kaf, and he opens that surah, he begins the surah by the praise of himself. All right. We see a similar one again, a similar type of praise in Surah Al Mulk, Surah 67 of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Tabarak al ladi bi yadihi al mulk wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Blessed is he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praised is he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Biyadihi al-mulk. Because he is the God that has dominion. He has dominion. He is a God of dominion. He has dominion in his hand. He has control of everything in his hand. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. And he is capable to do everything. He is capable to do everything. So Allah tells us that he, is, he praises himself in this way and he explains some of his names and attributes of perfection, of perfection. Again, in Surah Al-Isra, Al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Again, the beginning verses. Subhanan ladhi asra bi'ibadihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us here, Subhan al-lazi asra bi-ibadih. Glorified is he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that takes his servants through a journey, Prophet Muhammad, through a journey in the night time, Laylan, right? In the night time, min al-masjid al-haram, from masjid al-haram in Mecca, ila al-masjid al-aqsa, to, to the masjid in Jerusalem, masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. So Allah explains that this journey happened at night. And again, for this kind of journey to happen today, it's going to take a long, a lot of hours for you to get from masjid al-Haram uh, al to masjid al-Aqsa. But this happened during the night and the prophet went and then from then he ascended to heaven and then came back and then came back, back to masjid al-Haram. Because we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he's the creator, we have to believe that he is a God that has attributes of perfection that he, and he can do anything. When he wills or decrees a thing, he only says to it, be, and it is. It comes into fruition. It happens. So one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins a surah is that he glorifies himself. Is that he praises himself and he demonstrates and tells us about his names and his attributes of perfection. Another way Allah would open another category or different way that Allah would open a, a surah with is by a call. Allah would make a call. And this call is, would be directed 
oftentimes to a person or a group of persons, or it could be directed to uh, a category of people or the entire mankind. So we've identified at least three of them so that we can just get a better understanding of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would refer to one person or a certain group of people or the entire mankind. Allah tells us here in Surah Al-Isra that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ya ayyuhan nabiy taqillaha wa la tutil kafirin wal munafiqin Inna Allah kana aliman hakima Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts here by saying Ya ayyuhan nabiy O prophet so we see that it's a call the ya article is to call a person so if i want to call um, my brother for example i could say ya harun or ya luqman or ya ismail or ya abdul hamid right so we say ya to call on a person all right but when we use when want to call allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his original name you cannot well you you say ya allah ya allah right but when you try to call Allah by one of his descriptive names, you don't say, Ya Ar-Rahman, or Ya Rahman, you know, Ar-Rahman, Allah is Ar-Rahman. You say Ar-Rahman, you don't say, Ya, ya Ar-Rahman. No, it does not go that way. Because you have that Alif and Lam, the definite article that comes right before the name. So you say, Ya Rahman. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, he calls, Ya Ayyuan Nabi. Oh, prophet. So a prophet is the one person, right? So we see that Allah uses a call to open the surah by calling on one person. And we've seen where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uses a call to call on a, a, a group of people, a group of persons. Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ufu bil uqood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh believers, Ya ayyu alladheena amanu, O oh believers, awfu bil uqood. Make sure that you follow through and you take whatever, whatever, um, whatever uh, contract you have, make sure that you fulfill your contract. Make sure you fulfill your contract. So Allah calls and he tells us to fulfill our contract. And that call is demonstrated or sent sent out especially and directed especially to the believers and we also see where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call upon all mankind all of his creation where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says allah in surah al-hajj in the beginning verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says yeah, oh mankind, have the consciousness of your God because in the zalzalata sa'a shay'un azim, the convulsion of the last time, the last convulsion of time, meaning the end time, shay'un azim. It's a great thing that would happen. It will happen, and it's a great thing that would happen. So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the call as a way to open certain surahs. And that call can be meant for one person, can be meant for a group of people, can be meant for the entire mankind. Another example for the entire mankind would be the first verses of Surah An-Nisa, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhannas, daqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida. So, O oh mankind, for the entire populace, the entire mankind, have the piety and the fear of your God that had created you from one soul. So we see that Allah uses this system or this style to open a, a, a surah in the Quran. Another way Allah, so another another way Allah demonstrates or opens a surah would be by a factual statement. Allah would make a statement of fact, a factual statement. And if we look at that statement, some people might understand the statement to be a truth, a truthful statement, and other people might not know about it. So the statement of facts, for the most part, and for, for most people, are known. 
And sometimes Allah uses that to affirm a fact when people are unclear about if it's the truth or if it's not the truth. So for example, in, sur in, in the last Jews of the Quran, we have Surah Al-Abasa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts or introduces that surah by saying, Abasa wa that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he frowned and he turned away. And whenever a person came to him and that person was a little wretched, person was blind, person was poor, and the, person, the Prophet looked at him and he frowned and he just looked away. You know, he turned away. He did not face the person to respond to that person. So Allah, that incident actually happened. And when Allah started this, this verse, Allah started with a factual statement of something that did happen. That did happen. Another one would be the beginning verse of Surah Al-Mu'minun, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, On al -mu'minun, That the believers, the believers, the, certainly the believers would have succeeded. It's something that had happened already. Because you're a believer, you're a success here on earth and in the hereafter. Now, this falls under the category of many people not believing or not knowing or not thinking that because you're a believer, you're a success. But the creator, our creator, tells us that the fact that you are not just a Muslim, the fact that you're a believer, you're a mu'min, you have succeeded. The fact that you're in the state of Iman, you have succeeded. Called aflah al mu'minun. Then Allah goes to explain the different, uh, the different categories or different criteria that makes us believers. So we see that Allah opens the Quran or opens the verse, uh, the surah in the Quran with factual statements. And those factual statements goes to explain things that are unclear sometimes or things that are popularly known. Another way Allah would open a Quran, a, a verse, a, a surah in the Quran, a surah in the Quran is by taking an oath. Is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking an oath. And this is demonstrated when Allah takes an oath with a thing or things that he had created. Allah takes oath with things that he had created. And I really wanted to highlight this here. It, is, it should be noted that it should be noted that we, the creation of Allah, we mankind or the jinn kind, we can only take oath in Allah. We cannot take oath in the things that Allah had created. So when we say we want to take oath, for example, we can say wallahi, right? We take we take oath with Allah. All right, wallahi. We can say that. So we can take oaths in Allah or with Allah, right? But we cannot say or or Bishaykh this and that. We can take oaths in the Kaaba because the Kaaba is the creation. We can take oaths in the Prophet, even if he's the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he's the creation of Allah. We cannot take oath in a sheikh or someone we consider to be of high piety because they are part of the creation of Allah. We as Muslims are only allowed to take oath in Allah, the creator, and not his creation and not the things he had created. But because he created those things, he can take oath in those things. I hope that's clear, inshallah. We as the creation... We can only take what's in our creator, Allah, and nothing else. And Allah, as the creator, can take out in anything he likes because he created those things, inshallah. So one of the ways Allah would open a surah is by taking an oath. And we see that in Surah Al-Shams, where Allah says, وَالشَّمْسِ وَدُحَاهَا And by the sun, and, and by the sun, Allah takes oath by the sun and its brightness. Allah takes oath by the sun and by its brightness. And we see another one in Surah Al-Najm where Allah says, One Najmi ida hawa. Allah takes oath by the Najm, the, 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 the stars 
and when they are descended. And Allah takes oath again by wal asir. Allah takes oath by the end time. By the end time. So we see that, and there are other ways, Allah, a lot of examples of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken oath in the Quran and using that as an example to open a surah. Another one would be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would use a condition. Allah opens a surah by a condition. And this type of beginning is dependent on a, is dependent on a specific condition. It has to be dependent on a specific condition. And if that condition is then met, the following actions or the following statements will be true and will be activated. The following actions will be true and will be activated. But if that initial condition is not met, then the following actions will not happen. The following conditions will not be activated. Methalan, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, in Surah al Waqi'ah, Allah says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Ida waqa'atil waqa'ah. Meaning, when the occurrence occurs, when the occurrence occurs, meaning when the last day happens, when the last day happens, all right? Ida waqa'atil waqa'ah. The next verses after that, would then come into effect based on that condition of the last day occurring. Is that waqa'at al When the occurrence occur, laysa al And this time, it's not a lie. It's not a falsified time. It's going to happen. Some people, they will be lowered and other people, they will be raised. So Allah goes on to explain things that would happen. If this happened and this happened and this happened, all of that comes under the beginning. All of that, they come under the beginning, the beginning that what? The condition that what? When the occurrence happened. When that occurrence happened, then whatever Allah, whatever Verses follow would then be what would be activated. What would be activated? Another example is seen in Surah Al Nasr, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ida ja anasrullahi wal fatih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When the victory of Allah has come and the conquest. So, when the victory of Allah has come and the conquest, what do you see? Ida ja anasrullahi wal fatih. Allah says, you would then see people You would start seeing people entering into the religion of Allah Entering into Islam Afwajan in multitude In multitude So when we see that happening, the conquest has come and the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come. Because the victory of Allah is truth, is equality on earth, is the, the banishment of tyranny on earth, is the banishment of uh, tifri on earth, is the banishment of every evil, corrupt things on earth. So the victory of Allah is the, uh, is the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the law of Allah being the law of the ground, being the law of the earth or the law of the country. When the countries of the world would start to accept Islam and start to deal or make decisions based on the Quran and the Sunnah, the full victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been activated. Then a lot of people will start entering into Islam in multiple folds. Then Allah also tells us, when the earth is shaken with its final earthquake, meaning when the earth will take its final shake and it last shaken, right? That's the last, is, is the end time. Is that the earth will start to bring out 
all of those things that are heavy underneath, which is the humans that have been buried underneath. All right? So again, we would not be resurrected until the last day. Resurrection would not happen until the last day. And that last day, we will see that the earth would take or would take its final shaking. And when that happens, then the, everybody that had been buried would then be resurrected. And then we go face the last, uh, the, last the, the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, the condition for the judgment of Allah to be activated for everybody that's been buried to be resurrected, the condition is based on the fact that the earth would take its final earthquake, would have its final shaking. That's what would then lead to the, 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 the end time, inshallah, the end day, inshallah. Another one would be that Allah gives us a command. All right? So this type of beginning requires a certain benefit. All right? Requires a certain benefiting behavior from the creation. When we follow the command that Allah gives us to open that surah, it's going to be beneficial for us. All right? And this type of command, it requires actions to be taken without questioning. When Allah tells you this, when Allah commands you to do a certain thing, there's no going back. There's no questioning. Well, what if I don't do it? No, you have to do it. It's a command from your creator, from your creator. The first revelation we received that the Prophet ﷺ received was a command, a command to recite. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Iqra bi rabbika khalaqa. Allah tells the Prophet, recite in the name of your Lord who created. So if Allah commands us to recite, that commandment is not for the Prophet alone. It's meant for all of mankind. All of mankind, especially the Muslims. So as Muslims, if we're not reciting the Quran, we're not benefiting. Because Allah wants us to benefit. For us to know, to have the knowledge. And from each letter, you get 10 rewards by recite just one letter in the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that Alif Lam Mim is not one letter. But Alif is one letter and you get 10 rewards from it. So when Allah commands us to do a thing, there's a behavior that's expected and it's a benefiting behavior. Because we get a lot of reward when we obey and follow the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah also tells us, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, that say or profess that he Allah, who is one, he is only one God. So when we say Allah, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, all right, we're only demonstrating tawhidu rububiya, meaning we're, we're owning up to the fact that there's only one God worthy to be worshipped. And if we die upon that, we gain a jannah Because it's like, it's like saying, La ilaha, there is no other God, illallah, except this one God. So, Kul hu Allahu ahad is another form of saying, La ilaha illallah. And the Prophet wasallam says, whoever alters La ilaha illallah as their last sentence, guess what? They enter a jannah so we see that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do a thing, it's beneficial for us. That commandment is usually beneficial for us. And Allah, another example would be when Allah says, Qul bi nas. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of mankind. When we seek refuge, we don't seek refuge to water or, or other people or other created things. We seek refuge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way that Allah has shown the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam how to seek refuge or how to go back to him and, and, and hide under the shade of Allah and take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their protector. Today, a lot of people make dua and they're calling humans. Oh, ya sheikh, help me. Ya this help. They're calling other sheikhs. Some people would go to the grave, the graveyard, to go seek help and protection from a dead body that cannot help them, that cannot do anything. Allah shows us in the Quran 
And the Prophet Sallallahu has demonstrated to us in the Sunnah that we only call on Allah for help. Qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of mankind. Another one. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak. So those qul, they are a command where Allah tells us to do a certain thing. And when we do those things, again, the benefit comes back to us. The benefit comes back to us another one would be another way allah would open a surah is by a question allah would ask a question and we see this in two 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 verses here that i that i've demonstrated that i've placed up and to which the question if the listener pays attention the next verses or the following verses will attempt to explain what those questions mean or what the answer to those questions are for example, Allah tells us, Allah says, Have you seen the one who denies the recompense, meaning the day of judgment? When a person denies the day of judgment, who are these people? So Allah asks a question, Have you seen those that deny the recompense, the day of judgment? These are the people, these are the people that are very, very, bad and they hurt their orphans and they would not even help the needy by providing them with food so allah explains who these people are so for us to be able to understand and know who they are another verse would be allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in surah to naba allah says about what are they asking one another? What are they asking one another? And that question is as a result of when people gathered and they were talking about the last day. So Allah is asking, what are they asking one another? And in Naba'il Adim, of the great events that would happen. So Allah answers that right away in the next verse. And Allah goes to explain more of it in the subsequent verses. Because people at that time where they had a conversation and they, they somewhat denied that the, the, the last day would happen. So Allah uses the verse, to, he asks a question to open that surah, and then he continues by explaining what the last day would actually be. And we see that Allah also gives us an example of an invocation. Example of an invocation. And in this form, it says, Allah uses it to specifically address a person or people. Right, a person or people, because of the fact that they have disobeyed his command, they were disobedient or they disbelieved, and he uses that example. He uses that invocation to open the sura, uh, the surah, so we know how severe the punishment would look like. For example, Allah tells us, "Woe to every scroner and mocker." You see, so whenever, as, a, as, as, as Muslims, whenever you mock other people, for example, Allah is putting curse on you already because Allah does not want anyone to mock the next person. The Prophet Sallallahu tells us that we should attain piety to the extent where we do not believe to the next person or we do not even mock them or call them abusive nicknames that they don't like. So when we do things like that, we're only asking for the invocation, the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on ourselves, which is a bad thing. Another verse would be Allah says, lil mutaffifin. Woe on those who give less than what is due. Woe on those who give less than what is due. When they go to measure for people, they reduce what the measurement is, what the measurement should be. We see that happening a lot in the story of um, Prophet Shuaib and in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam too. So whenever as Muslims, we are asked to uphold the scale at a high level of justice. We cannot sell, for example, and we say, okay, I'm going to measure 20 pounds of rice or 20 ounce of rice and you give them 18 ounce and they pay you for 20 because you've you've cheated the scale a little bit you're not a muslim 
and there's a war of Allah, the war of Allah would be for people like that. So as Muslims and as believers, we're, we're, we're supposed to be the best of all mankind. We're supposed to demonstrate exemplar behavior so that people can learn from us. Even if the entire society are corrupt as a Muslim and as a believer, we will not be corrupt. We would stand for the truth, even if the truth is bitter, even if the truth is against our father and our mother and our children and our spouse. We stand for the truth. That's what a believer is. If, you, if the truth is based on the fact that you know that you're cheating somebody else, you got to say it and you got to stop it. You got to stop it. We cannot cheat the scale because it's a grievance. It says a very, very serious punishment that we can we stand in chance to receive from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and we ask Allah to protect us, inshallah. The one that's very unpopular would be that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala would open a surah by a reason or by a cause, and Allah states that in the in Surah Al Quraysh, where Allah says. For the accustomed security of the Quraysh. All right? An accustomed security of the Quraysh. They have a certain uh, 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 custom that they follow during the winter and during the summer. And that custom really, really saw to the fact that they succeeded in their trade and other people even came to their lands to, to trade with them. That was a custom that they followed and they succeeded in that path. And they had a security with it. So Allah uses that to, to open the verse because of their cost and because of, uh, I, I, it could be a reason too that they use, that Allah would use to open um, a surah. And the last one would be for g disjointed letter. For disjointed letter. And this type, we have more than 20, up to 29 29 instances in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used disjointed letters to open to open uh, a surah. And these disjointed letters, all right, they do not necessarily have any meaning or they do not connote, uh, connotate any abbreviation that we can, that, that we have, mean that, that we know anything to. They're just letters. There's nothing to it that we know of. All right, and again, they appear in 29 surahs. I've just captured a few of them here so we can see what they look like. For example, we have a Surah Al Qalam where Allah starts with the letter Noon. Wal wa ma yasturun. So, what's the meaning of Noon? No one knows. We don't know. We don't know. The companions did not. I mean, scholars have done ishtihad on all of these. I'm not going to go that route because the Prophet wasallam did not explain any of these meanings to us. So whatever ishtihad they've done is just an opinion. It's not a factual statement. Whatever the Prophet gives us of the explanation of the Quran is a factual statement. So the, the Prophet never explained any of these letters. So whatever explanation we get out there, they are opinions and they're not factual statements. So we also see where Allah says, Ain seen of the disjointed letters of Hamim Yasin Sod, you know, Tosin Mim. All of these are there. Kaya, Kaya, Ain Sod, Vikru Rahmeti Rabbi Ka Abeda Huda Kariya, Suratul Maryam. Again, those first letters, there's no meaning. We don't have the meanings to them. Alif La Mim Ra. We have them, but no meaning. Alif La Ra. Again, 
the beginning verse of Surah Al-Ibrahim. There's no, no meaning to Alif Lam Ra, but the next of the next letters or wordings, we can translate them. But Alif Lam Ra, we don't have the meaning. They're disjointed letters. Alif Lam Mim. Again, Alif Lam Mim is part of the disjointed letters. So we have those disjointed letters that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would use to open a surah. Some scholars have said that it's to get the attraction or the attention of whoever is listening. But again, the Prophet did not explain it that way to us. So their letters, Wallahu alam, Allah knows what the meanings are. We do not know what the meanings are. So the third, we're wrapping up now. The third, uh, the third uh, uh, item that I wanted to talk about today, we've talked about the eloquence of the Quran. We've talked about the beginning of the surahs of the Quran. And this is the, the ending of the surahs of the Quran. And the ending of the surahs of the Quran are very, very unique because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would end the surah in a comprehensive way, many times, in a comprehensive way, and Allah sends, or He closes the surah with a strong message. Usually because many times when we read a book or we read a story, we really remember what the end looked like, the end of that story, what it looked like, or what the end message was in the book. When you read a book, what's the end message? We really we remember that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had demonstrated this in the Quran in many areas where he would usually have a comprehensive message or a huge summary that drives the message home in the last few verses or the last verse to close that entire surah. For example, we see a similar example here in Surah Al-Ibrahim. The first verse and the last verse. The first verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lam Ra, this book, which has been revealed unto you, Prophet Muhammad, is for you to is that you might bring mankind out of darkness, where into light and into light. Out of darkness into light, be easy to be him by the permission of their Lord. So the prophet did not does not have did not have the sole power to make a person come out of darkness into light. All of these happen by the permission of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Be easy to be him. Ila surat al Aziz al Hamid. So the path of the exalted God in might and the praiseworthy God. So that's, the, that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens Surah Al-Ibrahim by telling us that he is the God that has sent us the Quran to Prophet Muhammad and the intent was for Prophet Muhammad to use the Quran as a tool to bring people out, out of darkness into light with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah ends the surah by saying, Allah says, this Quran, remember in the first verse, it says the Quran was sent down to Prophet Muhammad to take mankind out of darkness into light. In the last verse, Allah then says, this Quran is a notification, it's a revelation for the people that they may be warned. So you are expected to come out of darkness into light, but it's a Quran for people that they may be warned thereby and that they may know that it's only one God. Well, that they should know that it's only one God. And for those to understand, for those of understanding to remember. So those of understanding to remember would be those who have come out of darkness into light. So we see that as a correlation between the first verse and the last verse in Surah Al-Ibrahim. Another, another way Allah would earn the verse would be that in some of the cases, the surah would complement the beginning of the verse. 
the surah would complement the beginning of, of the verse. Allah would usually use the closing verse to emphasize the initial statements, the initial comments, the initial words that he used to open that surah. For example, Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah says, that certainly will the believers have succeeded. So those that are the believers, not the Muslims, Muslims, is the, they are in the entry stage. However, the believers, they have already succeeded. So if we state, if Allah states that the believers have succeeded, will the opposite also be a factual statement that the unbelievers have not succeeded? Yes. If the believers have already succeeded, the opposite would be a factual statement too, that the unbelievers have not succeeded. They have failed. They have lost, right? Allah says in the last, in last two verses of that same Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah says, وَمَنْ يَدُوا مَا اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. Whoever invokes or calls others beside Allah, that means they're not believers now. They call other things beside Allah. Allah says, لَا بُرْهَانَ لَهُ بِهِ Which they have no proofs. فَإِنَّمَا هِسَابُهُ إِنَّ رَبِّهِ Then their account is only with his Lord. Their account is with their Creator, Allah. Indeed, the disbelievers will not succeed. The first verse, Allah says, the believers have succeeded. In this last second to last verse, in the same surah, Allah says the disbelievers have not succeeded. So we see that Allah uses the same thing when he, the same way he opens a, a surah, he closes a surah the same way too. And the last uh, slide I want to share with us before we, uh, we round up today's section is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would usually have a correlation between two surahs. The same way the surahs have been lined up, we see that Allah would also use that way to explain how the surahs would then trans trans um, translate from one surah to the next surah. For example, surah to tur is followed by Surah to Najm. Surah to Tur is followed by Surah to Najm. Now let's look at the last verse of Surah to Tur and the first verse of Surah to Najm, meaning the ending verse of Surah to Tur and the beginning verse of Surah to Najm. In Surah to Tur, Allah ends by saying, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَسَبِّحْهُ وَإِدِبَارَ النُّجُومِ and in, and in a part of the night, فَسَبِّهُ Exalt him, exalt Allah, وَإِدِبَارُ nujum, And after the setting of the stars, when the stars have gone to set. So Allah talks about how he had, what he had created in the heavens, all right, that we can see. So Allah says, and at night, we should worship him, we should exalt him, and we should continue to exalt him, after the setting, uh, at the part of the night, we should exalt him. And after the setting, and after the setting of the sun, uh, 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 of the stars, when the stars have actually set. Then Allah then gives us the, in the next verse, in the next surah, the beginning verse of Surah to Najm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, By the stars, when it descends. So we see that there's a correlation between those two verses. This verse ends with talking about the stars. The next verse starts by talking about the stars. And Allah takes oath by the star. In, that, in, in Surah Al-Najm, وَالنَّجْمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا دُلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى Allah takes oath by the stars by saying that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi had not been led astray. You know, by saying that he had not been led astray, he's on the right path. Whatever he had seen when he went on Isra wal Miraj, when Allah took him on that journey, and then he elevated him to the heavens with Jibril, he actually saw it. All of those things happened, right? So 
inshallah, just to summarize what we went when we, we, we touched on today, which was a lot of information, we really talked about how the Quran is so vast in knowledge because Allah had made it that way, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a lot of eloquence in the Quran. We looked at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had helped us master the different sciences in the Quran, if only we can follow those sciences. We looked at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped us manage the way we understand the Quran by teaching us through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we also we, we, we took a look at how Allah uses different ways to open or to begin the surahs in the Quran. And we looked at how Allah would use different ways to end the Quran, the, the surahs in the Quran and the correlation with those surahs and other surahs in the Quran. And how Allah would systematically use that platform as an opportunity for us to understand the Quran and get a better concept of what is the right way to follow and how we can better understand the Quran. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make things easy for us, to make our affairs easy for us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us sabr in all of our affairs. Uh, we're going through trying times. Uh, many countries of this world uh, are seeing uh, uh, a lot of death due to coronavirus. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us all of our sins and elevate all of these uh, challenges and trials that we're going through. We also pray for the Muslims in different parts of the world that are going through trials. Muslims in Burma, Muslims in Kashmir, Muslim in, Muslims in Syria, Muslims in Palestine, Muslims in Nigeria, and here in America. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cover us with his mercy, to make, to make us uh, succeed over our enemies and make the Muslim ummah a solid ummah that gains uh, that gains conquest in the last day, inshallah. We ask Allah to forgive all of our deceased, their sins, our fathers and mothers, our siblings and friends and families that have passed on, that are, that, that, that are Muslims. We ask Allah to forgive them all of their sins and count us all and join us all together and reunite us in the day of judgment among those that, are, that have lived a righteous life. We ask Allah to grant us our genital freedoms without questioning and without reckoning. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by virtue of his mercy and by virtue of his blessings to make us of those that are constantly worshipping him and not make us of those that, are, that have gone astray. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirat hasana wa qinna adhab al-nar. Assalamu alaikum. Ma salam.